welcome to another inspiring podcast from C3 New Hope. For more information about our church and its locations, please visit our website at c3newhope.com.au. Well, uh, as Pastor Dan said, I pastor a church in Tweed Heads called The Gathering. It's not a cult. Uh, it is... <laughs> we had... We had a guy deliver some, like, Woolworths delivery guy deliver some groceries the other week, and one of my staff members grabbed the groceries and put them in the fridge, and as the delivery guy walked out, he looked outside the front doors, he looked back at the sign, and he's like, the gathering. It's like, is this like a witch's convent? Is that what this is? <laughs> I'm like, oh, no. It's like, no, we feel that name is uh, prophetic. We've been called Elevation Church for the last 12 years, not Stephen Furtick, he copied us. Uh, but Elevation Church, my in-laws started the church and just uh, we became the gathering. So we're our own church, Tara and I are leading it now uh, as of February last year. So one year, and we believe that name is prophetic uh, for what God is doing on the earth. Isaiah uh, 66, 18, God says, and I will gather all nations and people and they'll see my glory. And I want to remind us today, that is the direction of human history. It's not maybe God will gather. Every single person, every tribe, every nation, every tongue will stand one day and we'll see who God really is. That's what the glory of God is, is God showing who he really is. And so we just feel that we're called, as you are called here at C3 New Hope, to be a church who is on that journey of helping gather all nations and people. And I can see all nations here today. Africa. Come on. I went to Reinhard Bonnke's last crusade in Lagos, Nigeria. Man, 2007. Nigeria? From Lagos? Oh my goodness. Wow. Whew. All right, I better, I better start preaching because I am not a, I'm not a quick preacher. So I'm like, Dan, I'm so sorry. If I go over time, I'll never be invited back. Um, if you've got your Bibles, please turn to Ezekiel 37. I hear we're doing a young, young adults night tonight. I'm going to preach to the young adults. Nick, I haven't met your wife yet, but uh, I really believe God's got something special for you guys. I believe there's a miracle coming for you, Nick. I just couldn't help but sense that since I met you last night. The power of God's going to touch your life, and you're going to work in signs and wonders and miracles in such a, a profound and incredible way. Uh, I have a real passion. I see this series you're in, Go. Go into all the world and proclaim the gospel. Go and make disciples of all nations. And I have such a passion and a desire uh, for evangelism. It's something that I walk in just in my own life. And I have a desire to see every believer, every single believer, walk in this life of being a daily witness of who Jesus Christ is. And I'm convinced of 20 years this year following Jesus. I met Jesus in Sydney at Hillsong Conference in 2004. And so I've got a special place in my heart for Sydney. I'm convinced that you will not know the fullness of your life in Christ until you walk into the daily obedience of being a witness of who he is. When you step into it, something will unlock in your life. And do you know in the Bible there is no gift of evangelism? There's no gift of evangelism. Nowhere in Scripture will you see that he says, now all the evangelists go out and reach the world with the gospel. It's because there's no gift of evangelism. There's a gift of the evangelist. And Ephesians 4 talks about this. And Jesus gave gifts, some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be pastors and teachers. Why? For the purpose of equipping the saints for the work of ministry. I want to encourage and remind all of us this morning, each and every follower of Jesus in this place is a minister. You're a minister, not just someone up here with a microphone or on a platform. If you have said yes to Jesus and you're following Jesus, you're a minister of reconciliation to a broken and dying world, pointing them to the one who can save them, pointing them to the one who can fill them with life and purpose. And maybe you're here today and you don't know Jesus. And someone's invited you and you're like, oh man, what have I come to? I'll tell you what you've come to. You've come to hear about the meaning of life. 
You've come to experience the very reason for existence, the reason why you're breathing oxygen. It's because you've been created by a God who had formed you in your mother's womb, knows every hair on your head, and has brought you here today. There is no accident that you're sitting in this room. So if you thought you were just ticking a box because someone invited you, I want to say you're going to have an encounter with the King of Glory today. So I've got one scripture before I get into Ezekiel 37. And if you're writing notes, write this down. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. This is what Peter says to the church. He says, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. Hands up if you are thankful in this place that you have a personal God, a God who's intimate, a God who wants to have you personally as his own possession. I'm so thankful. As I remind myself that I was saved 20 years ago, I remember my life before Christ was broken. My parents divorced when I was 10 years old. I was angry. I was bitter. I was twisted. I was frustrated. And I tried everything in life. Drugs, girls. I tried the whole lot to try and satisfy this longing deep in my heart. But it wasn't until I met Christ It wasn't until he filled me with his love and his joy and his presence that in that moment, everything changed. And I realized, oh my goodness, it's Jesus is real. He's real. Can I encourage you, friends? Like Nick said, we're not just here for another service. We're here because there is a God who has called us into an intimate relationship with him. Woo! Come on. I get excited. I say in my church, I'm going to throw this microphone through the window one day because I just get so excited. You're called into an intimate, personal relationship with the King of glory, the creator of the universe. But there is a reason and there is a purpose also that you've been called in. And it says here that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. That you may proclaim. Here's what I know about the generation that's alive on planet earth today, is that we're great proclaimers. We are great proclaimers. All I have to do is jump on your Instagram account or your Facebook account, and I can find out what you're great at proclaiming. This is my food. I don't care about what you're about to eat. This is my holiday. You're just making me jealous. Every time you proclaim your holiday, I just want to be there. And I just realized we're, we're great proclaimers. I'm a great proclaimer. I remember April last year, I um, was having two weeks holiday with my family, and I was so excited uh, to have this two weeks off, being a busy year, transitioning to our own church. So I'm like, two weeks, going surfing, teaching my young son how to surf. So I'm like, this is going to be the best. Perfect little one-foot day for him. His name's Kai, which in Hawaiian means ocean, which is prophetic that he's going to be a world champion pro surfer. Um, so just pray that with me, would you, uh, over his life. And so I'm pushing Kai into these waves. I'm like, how good is this? Beautiful sunny skies, nice blue water. And then all of a sudden, I feel something wriggle under my foot and bang, stingray. Stingray gets me right in the side of the foot. And I'm just like, oh, I could feel it straight away. I knew exactly what it was. Level 10 pain instantly. And as I turn around and catch a wave in, my son's paddling out. I'm like, go in. He's like, no, I don't want to. I said, go in. I lifted my foot up and this blood starts gushing out of my foot. And now where we were surfing and where we'd parked the car was a good 200 meter walk. And I know nothing about stingrays. Been surfing all my life, but I know nothing about stingrays except an Australian icon died of a stingray attack. So I'm getting to the beach. I'm like, this is it. I don't know how long I've got left. I'm like, Kai, I love you, mate. It's been a great 10 years with you, son. And I'm like, just dying of pain. This thing was level 10. And, and I'm limping all the way to my car, deep breathing, like, <sighs> Kai's like, are you all right, dad? What's going to happen? I'm like, I don't know. Get to my car and I grab my phone. And what's the first thing I do with my phone? I don't ring my wife. I start taking photos of this thing. And I take the first photo, and my, my son's like, Dad, what are you doing? I'm like, shh, son, shh. I start taking photos, and here's the first photo I got. If you don't like blood, close your eyes. This is the first photo. It's not a lot of blood. But I take this photo, and I'm like, that's terrible lighting. That's terrible lighting. 
I'm like, no one's going to be able to see what that really is. So I'm twisting my foot out into the sun. My, my, uh, in, and my son's like yelling at me the next photo. I get a clearer shot of the stingray wound. Then I get to the hospital. This is the next photo as soon as I walk into the hospital. I walk into the, the emergency area and there's a, a, a girl waiting. She passes out as she looks at my foot and they're like, sir, come straight in. I'm like, yes, this is awesome. <laughs> Go to the next photo. This is after it's cleaned up. I've since found out in Catholicism, there's such thing called stigmata. When you have wounds that look like Christ, you can be sainted. So I'll leave that up to your own uh, interpretation here this morning. But as I'm lying there on the bed and these doctors and nurses are cleaning this up and they're putting pain block needles all around my leg so they can start to clean it out and stitch it up. I'm sitting there on my phone and my wife's like, what are you doing? And I'm like, I'm uploading this to Instagram. And I need you to hear this this morning. There's no way I'm going through all that pain for you not to hear about it. (laughs) We're great proclaimers. Whatever has your heart, you'll proclaim about it. And the reason why you've been brought out of darkness and into his marvelous light is so you can go about now proclaiming to the world that there is a God who can set us free. There is a God who can redeem us from the brokenness. I heard a little bit about Joel, is it, who was up here on the microphone story just as he was talking. And I'm like, oh my goodness, God is so good. So we're going to read through Ezekiel 37 verse 1 to 10, and this is a passage which God has spoken to me over the years about how he wants to partner with his people. You got to understand that. God wants to partner with you in his mission in the world. Now, Ezekiel, if you're new to church and new to the Bible, is an Old Testament prophet. A prophet was just simply someone that had spoken to, and they would be the mouthpiece and they'd speak to the people of Israel. The Holy Spirit wasn't poured out on all people like it is today, so they couldn't hear God for themselves. They had to hear from the prophet. Now, prophets had to live pretty wild lives that experience wild things. And so this is Ezekiel having this encounter and this vision that God's leading him in. It says this in Ezekiel 37, verse 1. It says, The hand of the Lord came upon me and brought me out in the Spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley, and it was full of bones." Then he caused me to pass by them all around, and behold, there were very many in the open valley, and indeed, they were very dry. I want you to picture this with your imagination right now, a valley full of very dry bones. And you know, if bones are very dry, it means they've been there for a long time. So God right now is showing Ezekiel a picture of a very hopeless situation. And maybe you've walked in today and you feel like you're living in a valley of dry bones. I believe this is going to prophesy over your life today, over your marriage, over your family, over your finances, whatever it is that is happening in your world, not all is lost when God's involved. Verse 3, and God said to me, son of man, can these bones live? So I answered, oh Lord God, you know, that's a, that's a political answer. Should have been a politician, not answering the real question. Again, God said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, surely I will cause breath to enter you and you shall live. I'll put sinews on you and bring flesh upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. Verse 7, I want you to underline this, highlight it, or tattoo it on your neighbor, whichever one you choose. Verse 7, so I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a noise and suddenly a rattling and the bones came together, bone to bone. Indeed, as I looked, the sinews and the flesh came upon them and the skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. Verse 9, and God said to me, prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain, that they may live. Verse 10, again, underline or highlight. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath came into them, 
and they, they lived and stood upon their feet an exceedingly great army. Oh, that's wild. I want to speak faith over this church this morning and over your life, that God is looking for people and he's asking you this question, the same question that he's asking me. He's saying, my son and my daughter, do you believe that those people who don't know me can become a living people once again? Do you believe that dry bones that are all across this region, all across this city of Sydney, all across the state of New South Wales, all across Australia, do you believe, church, that these dry bones can come to life? Friends, God wants to partner with us in his mission to the world. And I don't know about you, but that absolutely blows my mind. When I think about it, the one who created the universe says, Lachlan, I want to use your life. He says to you, my son or my my daughter, I want to use your life. And if you look throughout the Bible, all throughout Scripture, you will see God wants to partner with his people. From the very beginning, in the creation of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, he says, I want you to work with me. I want you to be fruitful. I want you to multiply. I want you to have dominion. I want you to subdue the earth. You keep going, you look in the Exodus story, God comes and finds Moses and says, Moses, I want you to partner with me and I want you to free the Israelites from slavery in Egypt into the promised land. You keep going all through the the passages of Scripture and you'll find God is wanting to partner with His people. Come to the book of Isaiah, one of my favorite prophets in the Old Testament. And Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah has this throne room encounter with the Lord. It's what I believe is coming for this church. I just prayed it over this amazing couple before. I said, the stories of revival I've heard over the years in this church, I really believe God's preparing you. I believe God's stirring the hunger in his heart, in your heart and in my heart for more of him. Because ultimately, revival is not just about full buildings. It's about our hearts being revived. It's about us seeing who he truly is. And in this moment, Isaiah goes through this revival experience in the throne room where it says he sees the Lord high and lifted up, seated on his throne. I want you to picture this right now. The train of his robe fills the temple. When he speaks, it's like thunder, the threshold shake. And the angels who, since they've been created, are flying around that throne and they're saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. And then it says, Isaiah sees how holy, holy means sacred, set apart, a whole other standard. When Isaiah sees this holy God, it says he's gripped with how broken and sinful he really is. He says, woe is me, I'm a man of unclean lips. Then an angel goes over to the altar, picks up a coal, flies to him and touches his lips and makes him clean, which is a foreshadow of what Jesus Christ would do on the cross. And after he's made clean, God is speaking to himself, the Father, the Son, the Spirit, and he says this. He says, who will go for us? Whom shall we send? And because Isaiah has had this encounter with who the Lord really is, He's filled with boldness all of a sudden. He speaks up and says, I'll go. I'll go. Here I am, Lord, send me. If you're going to go into all the world and you're going to proclaim the gospel to all all the world, you first need to know who you're proclaiming about. Because a lot of time in churches, we have a desire to see the lost come to know Jesus. And we can kind of just preach this like, just go into the world. No, you've got to go into the throne room. You've got to go into the presence of God. You've got to be revived in your spirit. And you've got to be like, oh my goodness, that's who's calling me into partnership with him. And if that's the God who's asking me, I'm going to go. I'm going to go. You go further into the gospels and you see Jesus, the son of God at age 30, start his earthly ministry. And the first thing he does is go and call his motley crew of disciples. Failed disciples ultimately is what they were. Fishermen tax collectors, political zealots, all these. And he says, come, follow me, and I'll teach you. I'll teach you how to be fishers of men. All this time, he's looking for people to partner with. I'm like, if I was God, I just wouldn't do that. 
if I was God, I wouldn't partner with you. I'm just going to be honest. I wouldn't because you'd let me down. <laughs> I can see in your face. You're like, well, thank goodness you're not God. <laughs> I wouldn't partner with me. Yet this is who he is. He takes people who have failed and he builds them into something that they couldn't do in their own strength. And he says, now come and walk with me and let's be co-laborers together. He wants to partner with us. Now, when it comes to evangelism, what are we proclaiming? Jesus said in Acts 1.8, before he sent it into heaven, he said, but to the disciples and to us, he says, but you will receive power. I want everyone to say power. Now, I want you to say it like you mean it. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses, I love this, telling people about me everywhere. What's the goal of evangelism? It's to tell people about Jesus. That's the goal. I want to encourage us and remind us, as Christians, we don't save people. We serve people. And the greatest way you can serve another human being is by sharing the gospel with them. What is the gospel? Jesus came. Jesus died. Jesus rose again. Jesus filled us with his spirit. And Jesus is coming back again. The five points of the gospel. I would encourage you, my friend, to remember them and rehearse them so that when you're in a conversation and someone says, well, what is the gospel? Oh, my goodness. Jesus, who is God, came to earth. He put on flesh and bone. Jesus, who is God, he went to the cross and he died for our sin. Every single person on the planet earth has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And that God who died on that cross went to a tomb for three days. And after three days, he rose back to life, defeating sin, defeating shame, defeating the enemy. And he ascended into heaven and he gave us a gift called the Holy Spirit who fills us. And now as believers, we are filled with the living Spirit of God. Not so that we can come and sit on a seat in a church service, so that we can be alive to Christ And then there is a day coming, and I believe it's sooner than we know, that that Jesus who ascended into heaven will be coming back for every single person who knows him as Lord and Savior. We've got a mission, church. We've got a mission. This is what Michael Koulianos, who's the pastor of Jesus Image Church in America, says. He says, the message of the missionary is not go, it's Jesus. The message of the great evangelist is not evangelize, it's Jesus. The triumphant message of revival is not revival, it's Jesus. The message of the prophet is not prophesy, it's Jesus. The message of the pastor is not how to build a big church, it's Jesus. What's the message of the church? Jesus. Jesus. And I've called this message the prophetic partnership because what is prophecy? Ultimately, prophecy is revealing the mind of Christ or the mind of God or the heart of God over a people or a situation. Now, when it comes to the mission of God, what is the heart of God? John 3.16, the clearest gospel scripture, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but will have everlasting life. The heart of God is that no one would perish. The heart of God is to have all people as his possession. Another scripture, 1 Timothy 2.4, says the God who desires all people to be saved and come to the knowledge of truth. So God wants us to partner with him in his mission, yet so many of us as believers are not walking in this. Like if we're honest... So many years of my life as a follower of Jesus was not walking in this. Why don't we as the church walk in this? I I think one clear one would be we don't know what to say. I don't know if anyone's agreeing with me this morning. There's just times where I don't know what to say. I witnessed to the lady in the seat next to me on the plane yesterday, fumbled it, absolutely fumbled through it. I'm like, Lachlan, you're going to share a message about how to witness to people, and you are fumbling this. But I learned her name's Jasmine. She feels lost, and she doesn't know if there is a God, and she lives in the Blue Mountains. And I said, Jasmine, as soon as you get in your car, I want you to cry out to Jesus. He's the one who loves you. He's created you. He's died for you. He loves you, my friend. And she just said quietly, thank you so much for taking the time to tell me that. 
But I'd say the number one reason we don't, or one of the reasons we don't, is because we don't know what to say. I'd say another huge reason we don't share is because we're afraid of what people will think. We're afraid. Hey, we're afraid of what other people will think of us. If I speak up, if I try and witness to Jasmine and I fumble through, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look like an idiot. And these would be some of the main reasons of why we don't witness. But I feel like I've come here to Mount Annan to see three new hope, to prophesy boldness over this church, <laughs> to prophesy boldness over you. Because when you step into this life of being a daily witness, I'm going to tell you, my friend, you'll never feel more alive. You will feel this fire inside of you that you'll be like, this is so exciting. And since I've stepped into this, since 2016, I pretty much every week come to the church with a story and people think I'm making it up. I actually don't care if they think I'm making it up because I just have some of the most exciting things happen in my life. Church is not meant to be boring, friends. It's meant to be alive. As the church, we're meant to live this daily life, alive in Christ. This is what Paul says in Romans 10, 13. He says, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Everyone. Everyone. That's your boss. That's your neighbor. It's even your mother-in-law. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. This is good news doesn't matter who you are, doesn't matter where you've been, if you call on the name of the Jesus, you'll be saved. Oh, he's so gracious, so merciful. Goes on in verse 14 and says, How then will they call on him whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they're sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. I don't know how many people I've come across just in the last number of weeks when I've shared the gospel with them. I've said, have you heard that? And they've said, I've never heard that. Church, how are they to hear unless you and I step up and walk in boldness and walk in confidence of the Spirit of God who has redeemed us and brought us out of darkness into His marvelous light so that we may proclaim who He is. How were they to hear? Man, we've got neighbors who are, who are living directly next door to us. And I know when Jesus says, love your neighbor as yourself, He's talking about everyone. But we've got literal neighbors that we've never met as, as the church. We've got literal neighbors. We don't know their story. We don't know where they've been. We don't know what they've done. I've been mowing. I moved into a new house about a year ago, and I've been mowing this little patch of grass for, grass for my neighbor. It's like a connected almost granny flat to our house. It's a bit of a different setup. And uh, he doesn't have a mower, so I said, I'm going to mow your grass for you. And not once in a year had he come out and said, thank you so much. And, you know, I was starting to get a bit frustrated by that. I was like starting to get a little bit bitter as I was cutting it shorter and shorter and be like, it's going to be dirt soon. You want dirt? I'll mow it to dirt. And uh, just the other afternoon, as I'm mowing it, rushing before it rains, I look and he's standing at his door. He says, you want a drink? I'm like, I thought you'd never ask. So I walk in, it's like 35 degree day, no fan, no air con on. I'm like, brother, what are you doing? <laughs> like, that's a really nice aircon unit you got on the wall there. <laughs> Not turned on. Uh, he's like, yeah, I've never turned it on. Don't ever turn the fan on. I'm like, yep, cool. And I'm sitting there dripping sweat, dripping sweat on his couch. I'm like, okay, he must be cool with it. And we're having a drink. He's like, what am I meant to call you? Are you priest? Are you what? <laughs> I'm like, oh, gosh. I said, bro, you don't have to call me anything. My church doesn't even call me pastor. I said, I'm just Lachlan. I started to hear his story of brokenness, of marriages that have split up and, and kids that aren't in relationship, all these things. And he says, start to tell me your story. And I start to tell him my testimony. And as I'm telling my, him my testimony of moments of encountering Jesus, the presence of God was so thick in his little room, in his house. Every time I'd get to this spot and say, and God spoke to me and God came on my life, he'd be like, oh. He'd be like, oh my goodness, I just got a massive shiver down my spine. And I'm like, I know exactly what's happening here. And I'd keep going on. I'd get to another crossroad. And this is what God revealed to me that I was going to marry my wife. And he's like, oh my goodness. 
tears started to fill his eyes and drip down his face as I realized in that moment, my job is not to save this man, my job is to serve him. And the greatest way you can serve another person is by telling them about Jesus, what Jesus has done. It's time for the church after COVID to stop focusing on all the wrong things. It is. It's time for us. Is there crazy stuff going on in the world? Yeah, it's crazy. It's crazy. That's why I'm like, Jesus has got to be nearer than ever. Is there some global elite and world leaders and all stuff going on? I dare say there is. But if all we do as a church is focus on talking about that, oh, the government's the Antichrist and Bill Gates is the Antichrist and and we're busy talking about other churches. Oh, that church down the road's just rigid. All they're doing is talking. Uh, yeah, so deep. They're just talking and preaching about the, the deep things of Scripture. And that church down the road's talking about that church over there being like, they're a bunch of weirdos. They've got no shoes on and they've got flags and they're just loose and in the spirit. And while the church is consumed with all of this kind of talk, there are people who are going to hell for eternity. There are people outside those doors right now that are not hearing about the one thing they need to hear about, which is Jesus Christ, the Lord and Savior. And while the church is doing all that, there is someone somewhere outside these doors right now who is opposite another person who's sharing the gospel and seeing that person come from spiritual death to spiritual life in Jesus' name. This is our mission as the church. So I'm going to finish in just a couple of moments. I'm just going to share two practical practical things. I love to finish on practical ways of how can we live in this prophetic partnership with God. So if you're writing notes, I can see everyone's got their notebooks and phones out. Uh, That was a joke. Um, (laughs) We're going to write this down. Number one, how do we live in this prophetic partnership with God? We've got to understand that the Holy Spirit is the master evangelist and he's setting you up. How do you live in this partnership with God? You've got to understand the Spirit of God who is drawing all men unto Himself is actually already at work. He's just going to set you up. And the reason why I share this point is because I just continue to experience it time and time again. And this is how it starts out in Ezekiel 37 verse 1. It says, The hand of the Lord came upon me and brought me out. It wasn't Ezekiel going to God and saying, God, hopeless situation down here, God. We need you to come and sort this out. No, it was God's heart for his people that came to Ezekiel and said, come with me, Ezekiel. I'm going to show you how hopeless and desperate this situation looks. When it comes to evangelism, partnership with God, you've got to understand he is the master evangelist and he's just setting you up. What I've learned in my journey as I continue to walk through this life is that God doesn't choose the most talented and gifted people. He uses the most available people. I want to ask you, are you available for God? Are you available to be used by God? A number of years ago, I was traveling through America, just looking at some different ministries and churches over there. And I did a whole bunch of different flights, like like seven different states in 10 days and different time zones. And I was exhausted And now what I also learned in America, I don't know if there's any Americans here this morning, I learned in America that they can't say the name Lachlan. So every time I'd introduce myself to someone, they're like, what's your name? I'm like, Lachlan. They're like, and they'd just fumble over it, especially at Starbucks. Every time I'd go to order my coffee at Starbucks, like here's uh, a first photo I'm going to show you. This is a photo that uh, I'd get these cups with these names on them. I'm like, what does that even say? That is clearly not what I said. And so this happened time and time again throughout America. And I was about to fly from Charlotte, North Carolina to Seattle. It's about a five-hour flight. And I was exhausted. I was so tired. And I just remember lining up at the Starbucks. And he's like, what what coffee, sir? And I'm like, cappuccino, thanks. He's like, what name? And now I just stared at him blankly. Because ultimately in my head, I was having a conversation saying, well, what's the point? Like, what's the point of telling you my name? You're just going to get it wrong anyway. And he's like, what name, sir? And I'm still having this conversation in my head. And then finally he leans across. He's like, what name, sir? And I'm like, Todd. (laughs) (laughs) 
He's like, all right, Todd. And he writes, Todd, on the cup. And I walk over to the side where you wait. Now I'm drifting off into like just exhaustion, psychosis. And all of a sudden I hear this cappuccino for Todd. And I'm not responding because my name's not Todd. <laughs> and then finally he looks at me. He's like, cappuccino for Todd. And I'm like, that's me. I'm Todd. I am Todd. I walk off and I send this photo to my wife. I'm like, this is how tired I am. And she's like, you need to have a sleep on this plane. So I get on the plane, but I don't like to sleep on planes. I like to witness to people on planes. Why? Because that person, where are they going to go? Are they going to jump out the window? What's going to happen in that moment? It's like, that's a preordained moment to witness to someone about Jesus. But because I was so exhausted, I was like, bang, out like a light. And I had a dream that I missed an opportunity to share the gospel with the person next to me. I woke up in a bit of a panic, and I looked at my phone. I'd been asleep for three hours. So there was only two hours left on the flight. So I quickly turned to the guy next to me, and I engaged in conversation. I just asked him what his, like, where he's from and what his story is, and then I always steer. Whenever I'm in a conversation leading towards uh, witnessing to someone about Jesus, I steer towards one question, and this is a great question that you can put in your tool belt when you go to witness, and it's simply this. It's amazing. It's so deep. You're going to be blown away. This is the question. Have you got a faith? You'll be amazed. If you ask that simple question, hey, do you mind if I ask you a question right now? Do you have a faith? That's what I asked the girl Jasmine in in the plane yesterday. Oh, I'm not sure. I believe in a higher being. That question just opens up so much opportunity. So I asked this question, have you got a faith? And he's like, oh, no. He's like, I don't believe in a God. I don't believe in this big being that's out there somewhere. And I'm like, oh, okay. And he starts to tell me how his life's been broken and all this different stuff. And then he looks at me and he says, have you got a faith? I'm like, oh, brother. (laughs) Oh, I'm going to share my testimony. And at the end of this testimony, you're going to be on your knees. This is what I'm thinking in my head. You're going to be on your knees in this plane crying out for the Lord to save you. So I'm like, yeah, I grew up, you know, and can I encourage you? Practice your testimony and narrow it down to two minutes. Because no one wants you to sit there and waffle on for half an hour while they are like, oh, Lord, I'm just so sorry I ever asked this question. You narrow your testimony down to two minutes. And so I said, yeah, I grew up going to a Christian school, going to church on Sundays. But I had a very broken family life and my parents divorced when I was 10. And I was super confused, super angry. And I went through all my teenage years just trying to satisfy that, that longing for something more. So I tried girlfriends, I tried parties, I tried drugs, I tried all sorts of stuff. And every time I'd come up empty. And some friends of mine invited me to a conference in Sydney, a Christian conference. I'm like, a Christian conference? I'm not a Christian. I don't want to go to that stupid conference. And they're like, come down, we'll skate around Homebush Stadium in Sydney. I'm like, all right. So I walk into this conference with 20,000 Christians singing and there was something different that hit me. And every time the preacher would get up to speak, I'd get awkward and I'd leave. And it was on the very last night, there was this lady, you might not know her, by the name of Joyce Meyer. Uh, She was preaching. And I don't know what she said, but she shared the gospel at the end about this God who loves me and has always been there for me and has always been pursuing my life. And she said, if that's you, I want you to come to the front right now. And I said, in that moment, this water bomb of love felt like it dropped on my head and washed over my whole entire being. And in an instant, I was changed. And I'm sharing this to him, and he's looking at me bored. He's like, and I'm like, it's the part where you drop to your knees and you cry out. He's like, I'm so sorry. We've been talking for like an hour and a half, and I haven't asked you your name. And I'm like, oh, here we go. I said, look, it's really confusing. No one can understand my name in America, so how about you tell me your name first, and then I'll tell you my name. He's like, who is this creep sitting next to me? And I just said, honestly, just tell me your name first and I'll tell you my name. He's like, whatever. My name's Todd. (laughs) I promise on my life. He's like, my name's Todd. I said, no, your name is not Todd. I said, your name is not Todd. He's like, my name's Todd. I said, prove it. Get your driver's license out right now. Prove to me that your name is Todd. And he shows me. I'm like, oh, my gosh, Todd, you're not going to believe this. I said, my name's Lachlan. He's like, what? I said, don't worry about it. 
I said, but at that last Starbucks, because no one can understand my name, Lachlan, in America, I ordered a coffee, and they asked what name, and I used the name Todd on the cup, and he's like, no, you didn't. And I got out my phone, if you can put that photo back up, I got out my phone, and I put, I showed him this photo, and in that moment, he's like, (gasps) he leans back in his seat, and he's looking at the photo, and he looks around, and then he leans in without a word of a lie, he looks around, he looks at me. And he goes, he sent you for me, didn't he? Now, because I've learned that I'm in a prophetic partnership with God, I just leaned into that moment, to be honest. I just leaned across and said, yes, he has, Todd. I said, and I've flown from Australia to America to find you. And I've traveled through seven different states, 10 different flights, and I found you. Here you are. Honestly? I am not clever enough to stand at a Starbucks and say, who will it be, Lord? Who will be sitting next to me on the flight? Todd. I'm going to write Todd on this cup. Then I'm going to share this story. I'm not clever enough for that. Only God can orchestrate this kind of story. Why? Because he's the master evangelist. And if he's the one who is drawing all men unto himself, he's filled his church with his spirit. And he's like, I just need you to partner with me. I just need you to say yes. I just need you to go. And when you go, you will realize I've already gone before you. I've already set this up. I'm already working in power. How do you step into this life of mission and partnering with God? You realize he is the one. He is the master evangelist. He is drawing people unto himself. And he just needs your humble, obedient yes. And when you say yes, you will see time and time again how God is working. Number one, how are we going to step into this prophetic partnership? We're going to understand he's the master evangelist. He's setting us up. I'll grab the keys up if that's okay. Number two, how are we going to step into this prophetic partnership with God? You really do have to understand and believe that He wants to do the impossible through your life. He wants to do the impossible through your life. Friends, we are a supernatural people. If we dull this life of Christianity down to just church activity, church services, ticking the box... That's just called religion. I just, I've I've tasted that life. I've lived it for many years. I've experienced it and I've just got no time for it now. When I encountered the Lord in 2016 in glory in our church, I was trying to build the coolest young adult church in the world for four years. So shallow, so like, so not God's heart. And he loves his bride so much, he came and he rescued that church. And how did he rescue it? He came in glory like a thick, weighty blanket, just went over the people one day. And what was spiritually dry, all of a sudden people started screaming out and crying out in tongues and weeping and praising God. And I stood back being like, what's going on? From that day, something changed in my life. I started to look at the church and I'm like, what are we doing, God? I started to walk around on the streets and my heart broke for people. I started to see people limping along with a a leg injury and I'd stop and I'd pray for them and I'd see that get healed. And I'm like, what is going on? This is crazy. This is what the Christian life is meant to be. Going into the world, proclaiming the gospel, making disciples and realizing he wants to do the impossible through your life. Verse 3, God asks, Son of man, can these bones live? He says, Lord God, you know. And then he says, I want you to prophesy. I want you to partner with me. Ezekiel, of course you can't bring anything back to life. You have no power outside of me. But when I ask you, and when you act in obedience, and when my spirit flows through you, you watch how the impossible happens in your life. So let me ask you this question before I finish. What would the impossible look like for you? What would the impossible look like for you? I'll say it another way in in terms of this mission. Who would the impossible look like for you? Who would it be? I just want you to think about this right now. Who would that impossible person, if they were to come to Christ, you would sit there and say, oh my goodness, 
no one is too far lost that they cannot be found. Who would that person be? Could be a parent, could be a sibling, could be a son or a daughter, could be a friend, could be a colleague, work colleague, could be a physical neighbor. Who would that person be? Now for me, you know, when I first, my dad moved to the Gold Coast from Brisbane, I started surfing at the age of 12. I just loved surfing. I poured my life into it and I loved pro surfers. And even from a young age, I'd kind of idolize these pro surfers. Then I, when I became a Christian at 19 years of age, God gave me a vision of seeing pro surfers come to know Jesus. And I remember being this young Christian being like, how could that ever happen? How could I ever have any influence in that space? I'm like, it's just little old me. Yet this became a, a dream in my heart where I was like, I just believe God spoke to me. And one day I'm going to see pro surfers come to know Jesus. It was 2019. We just finished our Father's Day service. I was in the next day in my office. And I was writing a message for the following week. And God just came on me and he just spoke to me. He said, I want you to write a card to Joel Parkinson. Does everyone know who Joel Parkinson is? I'll put a photo on the screen if you don't. I want you to write a card to Joel Parkinson. And I want you to honor him for being a great parent while living in the spotlight of the world. And then I want you to tell him that I love him. And I want you to wrap that card up. And I want you to get a pair of these socks that we gave to all the dads on the Sunday and they had Raising Legends written on the side of them. And I want you to encourage him as a parent, but I want you to tell him that I love him. And I want you to grab that card and those socks. I want you to go to his house. And where I lived, he lived just the next street around. When I'd ride my bike with my kids, I'd see him with his family. So God said, I want you to grab that card and those socks. I want you to go and I want you to put that in his letterbox. Got to be honest, I get sweaty hands even just thinking about it again. I'm like... That's called stalkering, God. That is like, and I just got so nervous in that moment. But I stepped out of my comfort zone. I grabbed a card and I just started to write, Dear Joel and Monica, that's his wife's name. So that my name's Lachlan. I'm a pastor in this local region. And uh, I just really felt God speak to me and say, he wants to honor you for being a great parent while in the spotlight of the world. And God loves you. I don't know what your story is with God, but He loves you and He wants a, he wants a relationship with you. And I said, here's some socks that we gave to all our dads. I want to encourage you to keep raising legends. I might see you in the surf one day. And I wrapped that, put it in an envelope, and I'm driving to his house. And I'm like, this is stalker level 3000. I can't believe I'm doing this. And I park my car and open my door and I look around. <laughs> and I run over and I place that card and that socks in his letterbox. I jump in my car and I drive off. I'm thinking, I just can't believe I did that. Well, a week later, Saturday night, I'm writing another message to preach the next day. And one of my staff members gets a voicemail message to our church telephone. And it's Joel Parkinson. I've got the voicemail here. Do you want to hear it? We'll play that quickly, that voicemail. Uh, Hi, Lachlan. How are you, mate? It's Joel Parkinson here. I'm just going to say... Thank you so much for your letter um, and the socks too. I've actually just read the letter in front of my wife and kids, and it was it was very moving. And I must say, thank you. Um, keep up the good work, and I, I guess I'll do the same as well. <laughs> thank you. It was it was quite quite moving. I appreciate it, mate. And thank you so much. Bye. And as I as I finished that voicemail, I just thought. It's not actually about Joel Parkinson being a pro surfer. This is about a lost son, a lost child. doesn't matter if they're world champion. doesn't matter if they have everything. If they don't have Christ, they've got nothing. And in that moment, I was filled with such courage and such hope that it was like, God, you really do want to use my life. And I was hoping at the end of that voicemail, he would say, hey, just want you to know Jesus turned up in our lounge room as I read the card, and now we're all Christians, and we want to come to your church. Is that okay? I was really hoping that was going to be the end of the voicemail, but it wasn't. But it's not my job to save people. It's my job to serve them. And the greatest way I can serve another human being is by giving them the gospel. And so I I share that. And what I didn't know in that moment, I was sowing a seed into that surf community. 
This is what Christians are. We are seed sowers into the world, taking the seed of the gospel and just scattering it. Can I encourage you? You don't have to wake up and pray the prayer, Lord, show me who to share the gospel with today. You don't have to pray that. Why? Because everyone needs the gospel, every single person. But I didn't know I was scattering a seed until the next year, COVID happened. All church buildings are shut down. And I had one of these filmers who, who grew up with these guys and he was a, a videographer. And he, he texted me and he said, hey, Locke, when a church service is going to be back open? Because uh, Dingo, now this is another guy by the name of Dean Morrison. His nickname is Dingo. There's three main pro surfers in the Cooley um, region of that era. Mick Fanning, Joel Parkinson, Dean Morrison. And he texts me and says, Dingo's in a really dark place and I think he'd benefit from a church service. I said, brother, don't wait for a church service. I said, if he's in a dark place, let's go see him right now. He said, no, I don't feel comfortable. I don't feel like I know what to say. I said, well, if you want, pass me his number and I'll catch up with him. So he passed me his number and the next day I'm sitting in a cafe and I started to text. I said, hey, Dingo, my name's Lachlan. Simon passed your number on. If you would like to ever catch up, you let me know. I get a reply back in like 30 seconds. He says, I'll meet you anywhere in 10 minutes. I said, all right, I'm at this cafe. He said, I'll see you there. I put the phone down and I thought, oh my goodness, I'm about to have coffee with Dingo. This is amazing. (laughs) I'm sitting there and I'm like trying to get real comfortable and cool as he walks in to be like, hey mate. I thought this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to be friends with him. I'm going to be friends with him. And uh, if I have to go on surf trips with him around the world to be his friend, I will carry that cross, God. I will do it for you, Lord. I'll carry that. And as I was thinking these thoughts, the Holy Spirit said to me, I did not set this up just so you can be friends with him. Should we be friendly? Should we be kind? Of course we should. But the best way you can serve another human being is by giving them the gospel. Dingo walks in, he sits down opposite me. And I look and I see this man who is empty, this man who is lost. I said, tell me what's going on. His partner had just cheated on him and left him with his little uh, three-year-old son at that time. And he was thinking about taking his life. And as I sat there in that moment, this cloak of boldness came over me. And I said, Dingo, I got to share something with you, mate said, it doesn't matter how much success you've had, how much money, how much fame, how much, all of that stuff. If you don't have Christ, you've got nothing. But my friend, He loves you. He loves you. And He died on the cross so that you could become a child of God. These tears fill His eyes, start to stream down His face. And in that moment, He didn't make a decision to follow Jesus. But I said, you have my number. And at any time you can call me. Well, a week later, Again, Saturday night, 7.30, my phone starts ringing. It's Dingo. I get on the other end and he's broken and he's lost. And he said, Locke, ever since you told me about Jesus, I can't stop thinking about him. And he says this, he says, I need Jesus in my life. And in that moment, I was able to share the gospel and lead him to Christ while he's crying on the other end of the phone. A couple of months later, I got to baptize Dingo out on the beach, out in front of my house. And every time I look at that photo, I am reminded that no one is too far lost that they cannot be found. No one is too far lost. God wants to do the impossible through your life, friends. Even if you feel like you're just coming to church and just going through the motions, I believe today God wants to touch your life with power. God wants to light you on fire so that you can be someone with zeal and passion. And you might sit there and say, but look, I've tried. I've tried and I haven't seen any fruit. Can I encourage you, my friend? Do not stop scattering the seed of the gospel. Do not stop sowing. Do not stop loving. Do not stop serving. Do not stop speaking. Do not stop proclaiming. Do not stop prophesying the good news of who Jesus Christ is. Because when you do, God says, I prophesied as I was commanded and breath came into them and they stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. We hope you've been encouraged by this message. For more information about C3 New Hope and its locations, please visit our website at c3newhope.com.au.